टेक ऑफ ओ गुड ना लुइस का मीठा हो हो ओए सर जी तो आई छति एक मिनट देखी partygammon.com everyone's playing sand sea and sand the royal towers stretching into the sky backgammon boards being set and played this can only be the partygammon.com million where 128 players will be battling it out for a piece of the million dollar prize pool It's all work and no play for our backgammon players as the million dollar prize pool is nearly in sight. It's going to take a lot of skill, confidence and luck to make it to the final table and with only 2 rounds left, it's all to play for. Let's remind ourselves who struck gold in the last round and who was left with a pile of stones. Last time out in the main event, 8 became 4 as our quarter finalists went nose to nose, eyeball to eyeball over the backgammon boards. Germany's Ralf Jonas brushed aside the Dane Henrik Vai. Another German, Andreas Martins, progressed into the final four after he beat USA's Arkady Tsinis. At the feature table, it was an all Danish affair, and Lasse Madsen, against the odds, proved to be a giant slayer as he took down Sander Lyloff, making the semis in a David versus Goliath affair. No such luck for Alex Lehman as his dream of Bahamas glory ended to man of the moment Nack Ballard in the only match where neither player qualified online. Looking at the semi-final draw, could internet qualifier Matson take another scalp in world number 1 Nack Ballard? The lower half was an old German affair with the experienced Jonas taking on the up and coming Andreas Martins. The prize fund a million dollars the winner taking the lion's share of 600,000 plus. Reigning world champion Vish Jaeger didn't make the knockout stages but he did have time for a chat on his biggest triumph. Tell me a little bit about that tournament and what it meant to win the the world championship. Yes, I went there. I told my son if I can win a couple of rounds, I will be happy. And slowly slowly every day I meant to be the winner and I came into the finals. After that uh it's you don't believe it. <laughs> so you have a thing that you think I'm world champion. Very strange, but slowly slowly you get used to it. What and, was and the the secret uh to your game in Monte Carlo? Uh um... I don't think there was a special secret. It's a secret of surviving every day. You see like a battle and there is one winner every time and if you have the mentality you say okay there's one winner I can be that for sure and you're rolling well the dice and you're a little bit lucky and your concentration is okay you can win the tournament it, it, it does seem that everybody here has a genuine love for the game uh, is that what do you love most about that game uh what i like most is that uh the game is uh, always new what i mean you can study and study and study but suddenly there's coming up something which you did not see before and that makes it quite interesting. It takes more than a shake and a roll of the dice to win a backgammon game. Luck can only take you so far. You have to make the right moves at the right time. Let's take a look at how to beat our competition. What's that sound I can hear? That strange whining sound. I think it's the sound of the bad beat. Backgammon, like poker, has its own hard luck stories. They usually take the form of I was so unlucky. Or the other variation is You can't believe how lucky that guy was. The reality is, great players know how to create more lucky rolls for themselves and minimize the number of lucky rolls for their opponent. I've created two positions to help you to understand one of the most important principles of backgammon, the concept of diversification and duplication. Diversifying your own good numbers means more lucky rolls. Duplicating your opponent's lucky numbers means less good rolls. Let's look at how that works on the board. Before we analyze the position, let's think for ourselves how Red wins this game. He's rolled a 4-1. He has two men 
behind a four point prime of his opponent's board, but he also has a five prime with one of black's counters already on the bar. For red to win, he needs to escape two men and come home safely and bear off. Most beginners will make the following mistake. They will come in with the four, eight, four, but then move the one from the 24 to the 23, believing that to be safe. The problem with this play is the critical thing that red must do is escape. And by playing the one here, you reduce the rolls that red escapes from any six or a five to any five. The number of rolls that escape will then be 11 instead of 20, almost halving the chances of achieving the single most important thing in that position, escape. In this next example, we're going to look at the principle of duplication. Duplication, as the word implies, means making the good rolls for your opponent the same whenever you can. Red is on the bar and has rolled a five and a one. The five is compulsory and must be played there. There are then three options for the one. 15, 14, 8, 7, or 5, 4. 5, 4 is the right play. The reason it's the right play is it's hit with the 3, as is the 10 and the 5. By keeping all of black's good numbers on the 3, we minimize the number of good rolls black can make the following play. That is duplication. I cannot emphasize strongly enough if you understand diversification and duplication, you will be more lucky more often in your backgammon games. Lucky to be here with Francois Tardieu. He's a three-time European champion, a French champion, and highly regarded as one of the top players in Europe. Now, Francois, tell me a little bit about how you started, how you began in backgammon. I am now actually I'm uh, 40 years old and I start uh, playing games uh, when I was uh, 16 uh, in high school and actually uh, when I went to university I studied um, uh, mathematics and statistics applied to finance so there was uh, some uh, correlation uh, between uh, my studies and the game of backgammon so you... there's some luck involved and some uh, management also risk management. Do different players have different sort of styles? Uh, I don't know, if they're more aggressive or...? Actually, yes, in the 80s, uh, the computer wasn't there. But with the computer now, uh, people have changed their style a little bit. And uh, they have learned something from the computer. Let, let's talk about uh, this, this tournament. I mean, uh, what, is, it, is it a very special tournament, do you think? Is it the prize pool? Is it the field? Uh, it's a combination of, of uh, several things. First of all, you have also the location, <laughs> which is uh, pretty nice. Uh, of course, you have uh, most of the best players in the world. And the price pool is, I think, is the highest uh, I have uh, ever seen, at least in Bagaman, yes. This beautiful resort is a place of fantasy as Atlantis comes alive. It's the perfect setting to crown our PartyGammon.com million champion. After the break, we get back to the action as the tournament continues. PartyGammon.com
partygammon.com. Backgammon is a game of skill and luck. We've heard from our top players in this tournament. Will they take their own advice and be in with the chance of winning a piece of the million dollar treasure chest? Or will luck be against them as they take their role? Mac, uh, tell me if you know anything about your opponent in this round. I don't. I've been trying to find out, but nobody knows him. I consider that a very good sign. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's Scandinavian, maybe from Denmark, uh, but I wasn't able to find anyone from Denmark to ask, and I'm not sure they want to tell me anything about his game anyway. They're probably all rooting for him. Lassa, tell me if you know anything about your opponent. Yeah, I've, I've, um, I've heard his uh, seminar at uh, one of the bigger tournaments uh, a few years ago. Do you uh, have any different strategies this round from previous rounds? Uh, no, not really. I'm just trying to play my best game and uh, hope for a bit of luck. Backgammon is played on a board consisting of 24 narrow triangles called points. The board is divided into four quadrants, each player's home and outer boards. These are separated from each other by a ridge down the center called the bar. The point furthest away for one player is their 24 point, and it is also their opponent's one point. At the start of a game, each player has 15 checkers of his own color, two on his 24 point, five on the 13 point, three on the eight point, and five on the six point. Each player uses two dice. A doubling cube with the numerals two to 64 is used to raise the stakes of the game. The object of the game is to bear all your checkers off before your opponent. They cannot start to do this until all checkers are in their home board. Let's get you up to speed on some backgammon jargon. Pip count. The minimum number of pips that a player must play to take off all 15 checkers. Run. To move a back checker into the outfield. Take. Accepting the cube offered by the opponent, thereby agreeing to double the number of points staked on the outcome of the game. Pass. To decline the cube offered by the opponent, thereby conceding the game instead of doubling the number of match points staked on the outcome of the game. This is a semi-final between Lassa Madsen and Nat Ballard. The loser of this match is guaranteed $60,000, but what they're really playing for is a place in the final. Well, four left here in the Bahamas, and you can tell a place in the final awaits just by looking at the heavy grimaces and the furrowed brows. What matchups we have, it'll definitely be a German on one side, but who between the very established Ralph Jonas and the up-and-coming Andreas Martin? And on the other side, a real David and Goliath story between the giant Knack Ballard and the internet qualifier, the Dane Lassa Matson. But who would triumph? Well, this is simmering like a Bahamian conch stew. We're coming in well into the semifinal match. Madsen's led the entire way in the 21-point match. The current score is 18 to 15. Ballard has cut the lead to 18 to 15 to make it very exciting. This game is shaping up to be really on a knife's edge which way it goes. 4-2. Two. two players make an extra point in board or make the uh, nine point, putting an effective six block. I, I, I must admit I prefer instinctively the, uh, the block on the uh, Ballard's men on the three point, but certainly worthy of consideration. What Ballard's thinking about now is doubling. As you can see from the graphic, he's about a two-to-one favorite to win this game. He's doubled. What do you think, Julian? I think this is a take. He's got a very playable position. It's a position that could go wrong, and certainly um, uh, from, from Madsen's position, uh, the cube looks very interesting at his score. A, well, take, a take and a double is uh, the end of the match. He's taken it. Now it's up to Ballard to try to improve his position. He rolls 3-2, which really doesn't do much of anything. Ballard basically passes with the play. Double four, double fortunate. Madsen could not have thrown anything better, establishing a five-point anchor and moving all the way down to re-establish that nine-point that I felt he should have made a couple of moves ago. Well, he's got it now, and he's basically neutralized the game. The game is is goes either way now. Ballard has rolled 4-2, but thanks to the anchor that Madsen has made, it's very difficult for Ballard to make progress. There's really not much he can do. Probably hitting loose in the two-point is, is all that's available. Yes, he has the, uh, the, s the relative safety of the three-point as some degree of insurance against a, a bad sequence here. Madsen rolls 6-2, which hits, but he has no good six. Rather than destroy his blockade by breaking his eight-point, slotting the five-point is clearly indicated. It looks crazy, but it's, it's the best play. There's no other good option. And once again, Madsen also has that insurance policy of his opponent's five-point, so he can weather a, uh, a series of hits. 
Well, Ballard has failed to hit, and this is crucial. The, the, the game is easing toward Madsen's direction. Ballard has no constructive play. He basically, once again, just buys time and hopes for something better in the future. Now, Madsen really needs to close his five-point if possible. And that's a 2-6, so he, he takes the hit. Right, he can't, he can't close his five point, but fortunately he can hit that one lone blot on the midpoint. Now it's back to Ballard. Ballard desperately it's, needs a five. Without um, a five here, he's in trouble. Not only did he fail to roll the five, he rolled one of the nine numbers that failed to enter from the bar. The advantage and initiative is clearly with Madsen now. Double ones. This is an excellent shot. It closes the five point. It also shifts from his eight point to a seven point, which will put pressure on his own one point in case Ballard enters there. This is an excellent position for Madsen. Ballard's in trouble. You can see the percentage uh, reflect now the significant swing of the game from Ballard, who cubed earlier on, to Madsen, who's now looking like a three to one favorite to win this game. Ace-deuce for Ballard's a tricky play. He can come in with the ace and then just step forward, or he can come in with the ace and hit. He's chosen to hit. This This leads to more complications, but I'm not sure it's the better play. It's a difficult one. If he hit, is hit on the two-point, he can re-establish himself on the one, improving timing. I think he's hedging his bets, allowing two different ways of, of, of winning the game. And Madsen came back with 2-6, put Ballard on the bar, and brought a builder in. Ballard is once again under great pressure to roll a 1, but he stays out again. Yeah, Madsen will be thinking now about taking Ballard off the 1 point. He's under no pressure to escape with those back men with three numbers, and that's exactly what he does. He attacks the 1 point. Once again now, Ballard really, really, really needs an ace to send one of Madsen's checkers back and to try to reestablish a position on his side of the board. But another fan, this is not good rolling from Ballard. This almost is. almost everything now works for uh, Madsen. He's got fours, he's got fives, he's got eights, but he rolls 2-1. There's little he could do. What he's doing is diversifying his numbers for escaping. He's concentrating now on getting those two back checkers into play and round into his home board. A hit at last. Okay, Ballard's once again con contesting the ace point over here. This is where the, the game really is is hanging right now. Which side is going to get away with making that ace point? Meanwhile, Madsen's roll an awkward number with 2-4. He brings a builder in, but he's got a few checkers stuck back and back now. And he's also had to abandon that nine point now, which was uh, putting pressure on the three. The 2-4, another fan from Ballard. Now almost anything will allow him to put a second checker on the bar, attack on the ace point, and oh, it's 6-1. 6-1 does absolutely nothing. It's one of the few rolls which cannot touch Ballard on the ace point. So Ballard's gotten a little bit of a reprieve. As soon as Madsen figures out which ace to play here, Ballard is once again going to be shooting, for, certainly for an ace, but even a three, even a three, if he can get back in the game and get moving before Madsen can escape with those back two checkers. Then it's far from over, and the percentage are reflecting that now. This game is far from over. Well, Ballard's in. He couldn't hit, but at least he's in and moving, although Ma Madsen now has another chance to attack and almost surely will. Double five, it doesn't come much better. He establishes the one point and also splits from the back, allowing his rear checkers to escape. No, this is a huge gain, and Ballard's now in big trouble. If Ballard can roll a three right now, three, two, three, six, even three, four, he can contest the game. If he doesn't, it's big trouble. Madsen, if Madsen can just hit the second blot or pull his checkers around, Ballard's in deep trouble. Double fives, another spectacular shot, another double fives, and it does it all. It pulls all his checkers out and sets the stage for a bear off. Ballard's going to need to hit a shot, or he's out of this. Remember the score here. Madsen already leads 18 to 15. They're only playing to 21. Madsen owns the cube on two. A double game win for Madsen is Madsen through to the final and Ballard has been giant killed by the online qualifier. Look at this. Double ones in the bear off. Clearly the best play here. He can think about taking checkers off but he really wants to do is play safe. The best play is to move four checkers from the five point to the four point. A point cleared is a point not to be feared. This is a great example of when to ignore one of the lessons in the tutorials about building candlesticks. This is a perfect example of when flexibility is not important and safety is. Right now they're, they're having a little discussion about where the checkers were before the play started. Madsen touched a few of the checkers and then put them back. In fact, the, the position is what they call clean, it's legal. They'll come to that conclusion shortly. Now what we're gonna be watching is Ballard trying to simultaneously bring his checkers home and improve his prime a little bit just in case he gets a shot. 
Ballard has two things to think about here. Does he try to build his prime so that if he does get the lucky shot, he has a chance of winning? Or does he go for the long shot of trying to save the gammon and hence his chances in this match? That's what he's looking at. Right. Should he bring checkers into the six point efficiently using his pips to try to save the gammon or should he build the blockade? He's actually chosen a little of each. He brought one checker home and then kept the man on the bar point just in case he needs to make it later. 2-1 for Madsen. The first thing he'll do is take a man from the four to the th two, keeping his high point even. And then optional either to move 2-1 or as he is looking at now, taking a man from the board. All right, Ballard's in trouble, as you can see from the graphic. His real chance is here to get lucky and hit a shot. With 5-3, he's once again torn between bringing checkers home or building his blockade. Uh, they don't really come home efficiently. I think, yes, I think this is the best play. Build up his blockade, hope for a shot, and there's a, still a very small chance he can win the gammon without hitting a shot. And a 6-1. The 6 is forced, must be played from the 4-point in a position where your counters are lower than the highest number rolled. That then becomes the highest number. So the 6 was taken off the 4-point. Now, Ballard just comes out. He's trying to save the gammon and hoping against hope there's a big doubles here, which gets a shot. No, it's a 6-3. He's left his high points uneven. Now there are at least uh, 12 shots here that leave a shot for Ballard. Ballard's getting ready. He's trying to position his checkers to build a prime. Now, 6-5, six, 6-4, six, 6-3, six, 5-4, five, 5-3, five, 4 three. All leave a shot. He rolls. 5-1. Five, five, but it's not all over. There are eight of Black's rolls next time. Six, five, four, or three with a one, which will expose the blot on the four point, and Ballard will have about a one in three chance of hitting that. He'll certainly save the gammon, and he may even win the position from here. Okay, here we go. This is critical. This could be the effectively the last. What is it? Three, three one. one. Oh my goodness! It's a shot. It's a shot. He's forced to expose a checker. These guys are rolling for the crowd. Now it's everything rolls on Ballard rolling a one. If he can roll a one, he'll save the gammon for sure. He's got. 6-2. Oh, oh, that's a heartbreaker oh, for Nack Ballard. There are more He's, ups and downs in this game than the World Trampolining Championships. He's basically, he now will lose the game. The graphic will show he's 100% to lose the game. So his only distant hope here is can he save a double game and not lose the match? He's got to find a way to take one checker off the play. The Rolls double one, he's found it. Two crossovers. Move up, and he double five or six, preceded by Madsen throwing a single one, and he gets a checker off and stays in this match. Double six. It wasn't to be. He found the play. It wasn't good enough on this day. Wow, you've, you've taken down a giant. Tell me how you feel. Good, good. <laughs> Nag is a great player, and it's a great feeling to, uh, to get lucky and beat him. Congratulations, Andres. Tell me about the match. Thank you. It was an unbelievable match. Uh, he was up in the first, and I'm nearly, um, I'm nearly lost. And then it's come to double match point, and uh, lucky roll wins the match. If I roll a one, I'm, I'm lose the match. So unbelievable. It's been another exciting round as four become two. Now Andres Merten and Lance Hjorth Matson go head to head. Both have a chance to meet their destiny, but only one will be crowned champion. Join us next time with the sand between our toes and the dice in our hands for more action from the Partygammon.com Million. Partygammon.com. Everyone's playing.